The Middle East, so many moving parts, so many layers of uncertainty, so many stress lines that no pundit, uh, no policymaker, no U.S. president has really ever been able to figure it all out, which is what makes strategic questions about this region, we think, so very debatable. So that's what we're going to do. We are going to debate them. I'm John Donvan. This is Intelligence Squared U.S. We are here with our live audience at the Symphony Space in New York City. Our theme for this outing, unresolved shifting power in the Middle East. And our use of this word unresolved is very deliberate. It's how we signal that we think that there is so much to dig into in this region, so many cross currents, that we are actually going over the course of this program to argue through three separate resolutions, one after the other, and we are gonna have five debaters on the stage, deliberately an odd number, who will each be flying solo, taking a position of yes or no on each of these resolutions. So let's meet our debaters in just a moment, but before we do, I wanna give a reminder to those of you who might have just arrived that we would like you to cast your pre-debate vote on these resolutions. Go to iq2us.org forward slash vote, and you will be prompted to vote yes or no on the resolutions Trump is right on Saudi Arabia, the world is safer without the JCPOA, that's the uh, shorthand for the Iran nuclear deal, and Turkey is an asset to NATO. Let's meet our debaters. First, ladies and gentlemen, once again, please welcome Roel Mark Garrett. Well, it's great to have you here. You are a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. You're a former CIA case officer. You are an experienced Intelligence Squared debater as well. Uh, you have now four debates under your belt with us. Well, it's great to have you back with us again tonight. My pleasure. Next to Royal at the debating table, please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Bernard Haeckel. Hi, Bernard. Welcome to Intelligence Squared. You are a professor of Near Eastern Studies at Princeton. You're a Guggenheim Fellow, and you're the co-editor of the book Saudi Arabia in Transition, Insights on Social, Political, Economic, and Religious Change. Bernard, we look forward to hearing your views and insights this evening. Thanks so much for joining Thank us. You. Next, Michael Duran. Michael, you are a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. Uh, you served in the Bush administration as senior director on the National Security Council, among other positions. Uh, you're also an experienced Intelligence Squared U.S. debater. This is your third time on our debate stage, and we can't see, wait to see what you have in store for us tonight. Michael, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Next in the lineup, Barbara Slavin. Barbara, you're director of the Future of Iran Initiative and a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. You're an author and a columnist and expert on Iranian affairs. Uh, you and I were journalists together in 1986 in Libya as American bombs fell on the city, which was a very, very harrowing experience. I am glad that we are both here tonight. Barbara, Me it's too. a pleasure to have you. Good to be here. And next in line, Brett McGurk. Brett, you're uh, currently a distinguished lecturer at Stanford. Uh, previously, you served senior positions in the Bush and the Obama and the Trump administrations, including a special presidential envoy for the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS under Presidents Obama and Trump. Brett, it's great to have you on our stage for what we think is a timely debate. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Brett, and thanks to all of our debaters. So um, I just want to remind you again of how this is going to unfold. We're going to be working through three different resolutions, one at a time. Uh, for each of these resolutions, at the moment that I announce, uh, announce it and invite a debater to speak on it, that debater will declare yes or no to the statement. So we'll find out at that point what positions they're going to be taking. They will have each 90 seconds to make their case for why they're taking that position. So let's get to the debate. The first of our three resolutions deals with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has some tough critics here in the U.S., including among members of Congress from both parties, but a more forgiving perspective uh, comes from President Trump himself, who appears more likely to excuse than to criticize some of the excesses of the kingdom, and who told his controversial prince, Mohammed bin Salman, according to the New York Times, you're doing a terrific job. So given that, our first resolution is this. Trump is right on Saudi Arabia. Our first speaker on this resolution will be Michael Duran. The resolution, Trump is right on Saudi Arabia. Michael, how do you declare yes or no? Yes. 
And you have 90 seconds. The floor is so. yours. Thank you. Uh, the President is right on Saudi Arabia uh, because he understands that we've had two elections from two different parties, two presidential elections, that have elected candidates who said the United States is going to pull back from the Middle East. First that was Barack Obama, and then that was, uh, that was Donald Trump. Uh, he understands that the American public is not willing to have uh, another George W. Bush style intervention in the Middle East. And yet he also knows, um, as I think does our entire national security elite, that we can't just leave the, leave the Middle East and leave it to its own devices. That's the legacy, that's the lesson of the Obama administration's foreign policy. President Obama tried to pull back. He, the last thing he wanted to do was to go back in Iraq and to get involved in Syria, but he had to because we have to have order in the Middle East. And if the United States is going to make order in the Middle East and it's not going to do it itself, then it has to have friends and it has to work with allies. Um, and the number of allies who can work to create a regional order is actually very small. The number of candidates who can project power beyond their borders. There are only three, and they are Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey. That's it. There's no other choice. If we're not going to do it ourselves, we have to do it with friends. There's no other possibility. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Michael Duran. Mm -hmm. We move on to our next debater on the same question. Trump is right on Saudi Arabia. Barbara Slavin, how do you declare, yes or no? No. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't mention the United Arab Emirates, but anyway. Um, no, the Trump administration has squandered its leverage in the Middle East by blindly supporting the Saudi monarchy, and in particular, its reckless uh, and cruel crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman. There was no good reason for Trump to go to Saudi Arabia as his first foreign trip. He could have gone to a democratic ally of the United States. His bet appeared to be that the Saudis would be so bowled over by this presidential attention that they would forge an overt alliance with Israel and spend billions more dollars on US weaponry. While the Saudis have drawn somewhat closer to the Israelis, they uh, have not supported Trump's unilateral, unilateral moves like uh, moving our embassy to Jerusalem or recognizing the Golan Heights, and they haven't bought, bought much additional US hardware. Meanwhile, Mohammed bin Salman, who's known as MBS, has made a series of disastrous decisions, including boycotting Qatar, holding the prime minister of Lebanon and nearly 400 Saudi business, businessmen hostage, waging a brutal war in Yemen, and last, but very much not least, murdering the journalist Jamal Khashoggi uh, a year ago. Had the US taken a different tack, we would have had much more leverage with the Saudis, and it's possible that MBS would not have become crown prince. Thank you, Barbara Slavin. Brett McGurk, you're next in line on the resolution Trump is right on Saudi Arabia. Are you yes or no? I'm a no, John. Uh, take Trump out of the question. We're here on the Upper West Side. I can imagine what uh, most of the audience thinks. But take Trump out of the question. What do we want from Saudi Arabia? We want a moderate Saudi Arabia. We want a successful Saudi Arabia. We want a Saudi Arabia that is working for stability in the region. Trump has given Saudi Arabia unconditional love. And there should be no unconditional love in the Middle East. We had no ambassador for two years. We had no engagement from the Secretary of State because Trump went around the Secretary of State. And look at the results. Saudi Arabia today is weaker, more isolated in the region and in Washington, and facing increasing problems. On Trump's watch, and I agree with Michael, we need a united front in the region. On Trump's watch, the GCC, the, Global Co the, the Gulf Cooperation Council, six countries in the Gulf, has split because the Saudis have led a boycott of Qatar. That has weakened our ability to deal with problems in the region and Iran. Saudi Arabia on Trump's watch has escalated the war in Yemen, and we've basically abandoned diplomacy in Yemen to try to de-escalate that humanitarian catastrophe. On Trump's watch, bipartisan majorities in Congress, which are rare these days, have rebuked Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is now becoming a partisan issue in Washington, which is not good for us and not good for Saudi Arabia. Defense spending in Saudi Arabia, they spend 11% of their GDP on defense. They spend more than Russia on defense, and yet they are in desperate need of domestic reforms because they have an economic crisis, and we are not working with them at all on these critical questions. So I speak as a friend of Saudi Arabia, and the record, I think, speaks for itself. Trump has not been good for Saudi Arabia. Thank you, Brett McGurk. 
Rule Mark Eric, Trump is right on Saudi Arabia, yes or no? Hey. No. I mean, I have to say, this is an odd occasion. I'm in agreement with Barbara Slavin, sort of. Uh, <laughs> the foundation for defensive democracy. I tell my you. God. Um, I mean, I'm going to define this fairly <laughs> narrowly. Uh, you know, I think President Trump has some flexibility in his definition, so I'm going to utilize the same flexibility. Uh, I, if you look at Saudi Arabia, is it really an ally of the United States in the sense that uh, can it uh, allow the United States to diminish its footprint in the region? And can it help build an alliance against the Islamic Republic of Iran, which is the most convulsive and lethal force in the region? And I think the answer there has to be no. I mean, the, the Saudis are incapable of using ground troops in any meaningful sense. Uh, in Syria, the Iranians, the Russians, and the Assad regime have slaughtered hundreds of thousands of Sunnis and the Saudis were able to do nothing. Uh, Saudi Air Force has some power, but let's be honest, if the Americans aren't there lending a hand, uh, they can't really do anything. You don't trust them. I think that has come clear in the Yemen war. There's a good reason for the Saudis to be fighting in Yemen. However, I would disagree in the way that they have done it. I don't think it's been terribly productive. Uh, and again, it's largely because the MBS in particular goes his own way and he's not reliable. And I would say, I mean, just take, for example, the murder of uh, Khashoggi. Uh, I think it's fair to say that was a botched effort. Uh, well, I'm sorry, your time is up, but you can continue your thoughts. I would just say the Iranians do a vastly better job. I mean, you cannot, the Saudis cannot okay. actually kill someone competently. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Don't trust Okay, them. okay, okay. Um, an odd way to put it. Trump is right on Saudi Arabia. Bernard Haeckel, are you yes or no? I'm a, I'm a yes. I'm with Michael on this one. Um, I think that um, Trump has basically seen the, the lie of the land in the Middle East, and he's seen in Saudi Arabia a regime that is willing to do certain things that are profoundly in America's interests. The first of which is the complete cessation of all funding to Islamists and to Muslim political radicals throughout not just the region, but the entire world. Saudi Arabia now is in a transition away from Islam being a fundamental core element of its identity towards a, a country that is more like a normal country where nationalism uh, is, the, the, is central to the identity of the country. The second thing that this uh, regime is doing in Saudi Arabia is that it is trying to change and modernize its society by clamping down on re reactionary Islamists domestically. It has given greater rights to women, something that was thought impossible before the present regime in Saudi Arabia. Women are now in the public, uh, in the public arena, they're in the workforce, they're driving, and this seems to me to be a, a, a momentum that cannot be stopped. So on a, number of, on a number of issues, Trump has been right to support this regime. Now, this regime has also made terrible blunders in Saudi Arabia. The killing of Jamal is only one. The war in Yemen is the other. But you can't you know, pick and choose your allies, and we are stuck with Saudi Arabia. And we want it to move in the right direction. Thank you, Bernard Haeckel. And that concludes the opening round. And now we have a more freewheeling conversation, but what we have are on the resolution, Trump is right on Saudi Arabia, three no's and two yeses. The no's uh, have described Trump's uh, position on Saudi Arabia as unconditional love and as blind support, as reckless and naive. Uh, they're basically arguing that uh, Saudi Arabia does more harm than good for U.S. interests, that it's an unreliable ally, a weaker ally than before, uh, and that, that bottom line, um, cozying up is not is not bringing about uh, an improvement uh, of the position of U.S. interests. The two debaters on the other side make a very strong argument. Number one, we need the ally. Uh, Saudi Arabia has been an ally. Saudi Arabia will do things that uh, we want Saudi Arabia to do. Some of them might not be very pleasant, but we want them to do it. And that uh, Saudi Arabia is changing, is trying to change, and becoming uh, less perhaps offensive culturally and politically than it has been in the past. So we have a lot to dig in there. I want to start. Uh, with you, Barbara Slavin, um, the, the position that your argument, your, some of your now at this point opponents are taking, that um, at bottom Saudi Arabia does deliver, that, that if, we, if we need uh, an ally out there to do stuff, give us places to base our planes, for example, 
spend money in areas we want it spent, for example, that Saudi Arabia does it and that nobody else is going to do it and that that's, that's the, the key of the argument for why it's a good thing to keep Saudi Arabia in our corner. Yeah, well, look, I'm not arguing that we should cut relations with Saudi Arabia. I just think we need more balance in our relations with various countries in the region. And I think that embracing this blind anti-Iran position uh, was a particular mistake, and I know we're going to get to that. But there are other places. I mean, we have the United Arab Emirates. We have Qatar. We have our biggest air base in Qatar. So we don't really need Saudi Arabia. Uh, for that. Uh, I support the idea that the Saudis are trying to reform, uh, but, you know, they've got most of the advocates of reform in prison, including a number of women who, you know, wanted the right to drive, and uh, so they have the right to drive, but instead these women are in jail. I just why, think why MBS does that is... Why does that matter to U.S. interests? Because I think MBS has shown that he has terrible judgment, that he's reckless and cruel. And he is not somebody that we should put a lot of faith in. I think we have to be very, very careful and not put all our eggs in his basket. Michael Duran, to respond? Look, the, there are realities of power in the world, and there's a realities of power in the Middle East. We are not going to remake this, this region into, an image, into our own image. We're not, gonna, we're not going to coerce these people through military force, and we're not going uh, to entice them to be like us. We have, we have interests. We have to focus on those interests, and we have to think about who are the most influential actors that can help us. The problem we have in the region now is the rise of Iran. Iran is spreading its influence all over the region through proxies. It's delivering to them precision weapons. They're threatening all of our, uh, all of our allies, and especially Israel. And Saudi Arabia sees the region exactly as Israel does. And it's using its resources and its influence, which is considerable, in oil markets, in Europe, uh, within, in Washington uh, even, to, put to, um, to project a picture of the region and our interests and their interests that is identical to Israel's interests. Barbara, I'm, I, I'm sorry, but you know, the war in Yemen has been a gift to Iran. Every stupid thing MBS does is a gift to Iran. He is not a reliable ally for Brett the United McGurk. States. Look, I've worked with MBS, and he actually is someone who uh, you can reason with. If you simply give him unconditional support, as Trump has done, again, no ambassador in Riyadh. I worked for two years in the, in the Trump administration. There's no ambassador there for two years. We had no very senior level engagement because everything was going around uh, the entire national security team who actually knows something about the region. But I keep hearing Trump sees this, he sees this. Trump doesn't see anything. There's no strategy behind this. Trump, Trump is being described, he's being described as a close friend of Saudi Arabia. This is a man who has said repeatedly that King Salman the custodian of the two holiest mosques of Islam, a very important figure, would be gone in two weeks without our military support. That's what Trump says to him. He embarrasses them. He diminishes them. He brings MBS in the Oval Office with posters of ships and boats. As a senior Middle East leader said to me, it looks like you've been bought. He is not a benefiting Saudi Arabia. And I speak again as a friend of Saudi Arabia. I agree with the moderate, the moderate reforms. That has to happen. We're not helping. We're making it worse. Bernard Haeckel. I mean, I, I think that uh, there are a couple of assumptions that have been made here. One is that somehow if Trump wouldn't support the regime, then someone else could have come into power. MBS is, could, could have been replaced by the United States. I think that's hogwash. We cannot interfere in the internal workings of another country like Saudi Arabia. It's a very opaque place, and the royal family has total dominance and control over the society. And MBS is in charge. Now, if we want to start meddling there in a way like I, sus I suspect uh, Barbara would like us to do, we could have a civil war in that country. Yeah, a civil war in a country that produces over 10 million barrels of oil a, a day. A country that when we tell it, you need to produce more because there's been a cutoff or shutoff of oil either in Libya or Venezuela or wherever, they will do it. They are an ally of the United States. They're not perfect, far from it. They have lots of warts and we should put pressure on them to fix those warts. But to pressurize them to, to behave in exactly the way that we want them to behave is not going to work. But the well, question is whether Trump... Do you, yeah, the question is whether I want to bring in... Trump, Trump is I, a wait, good policy. Folks, we haven't heard from well yet. I want to give him a chance to get into the conversation. Then I'll come to you as well. But um, so, so just bouncing off of what Bernard was saying, that we shouldn't meddle, can't meddle. Are you actually arguing in your no position for wanting to change and shape what Saudi Arabia is? Not 
really. I mean, I think the, I think the primary thing you always have to be concerned with uh, Middle Eastern societies, particularly a traditional one like Saudi Arabia going into transition, is its fragility. Uh, so I think the primary American objective with Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia is do less. Uh, I think it should be, we should want them to do less uh, outside of Saudi Arabia, and we should probably want them to do less inside of Saudi Arabia. I'm not a terribly big fan of the argument that says uh, we want authoritarian leaders to coerce their societies into progress. I think modern Middle Eastern history tells you just the opposite, that these uh, progressive leaders, the ones that are usually embraced by the West, end up uprooting uh, traditional society and actually bringing on that which we wanted them to, to actually stop. It makes it the situation mm -hmm. worse. It makes it into a pre-revolutionary situation. So I think the United States wants evolution in Saudi Arabia. All societies evolve, but you would want to do it conservatively, and you do not want to see the Saudis, particularly MBS, start trying to throw its muscle around the region because it's just going to muck it up. Brett, you would have wanted to jump in a moment ago. I just, well, the, the war in uh, Yemen was mentioned, but even on the war in Yemen, and I agree with the Iranians are doing it in, in Yemen is terrible, but on Trump's watch, the UAE, the only real ally with Saudi Arabia and Yemen, is leaving. So the whole record here, I think, speaks for itself. Um, it just has not been beneficial to Saudi Arabia or to our interests. Mm -hmm. Just one, po one uh, point on the crown prince. Sure. Um, Jared Kushner, Trump's son-in-law, developed a relationship with MBS before he was crown prince, and he pushed him and pushed him. And I'm sure that had some influence in Riyadh, because there were others who could have been named crown prince, if not for the, the mucking around of the Trump administration and Trump's son-in-law. So I don't agree with that. I actually I I agree I with you make, that we should I want, make, I want to give Michael a, I want to a make, shot uh, yeah. I want to make two points. One is this. Um, since the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, this is be, everyone in America knows his name. We've got in China. They don't pronounce it. We've got it. Up. We've got in China. We've got in China a million people in concentration camps. There hasn't been as much attention on that as there's been on Jamal Khashoggi. That's true. Why? Why? It's not because of Saudi Arabia. It's not because of MBS. It's because of the relationship between Jared Kushner and MBS. It's all about, it's an indirect way of going after Trump. No. We have become an incredibly parochial country where our, our domestic debate, we, we now talk about foreign policy to score, uh, debate, to score points in our domestic debate. This is not the way, this is not the way to run a good foreign policy. One, one last point, okay, quickly, sure. very okay. quickly. Yeah. The Yemen war, we had, a, we had a great deal with Saudi Arabia for, for, for many, many years, 75 years. They bought our arms and they didn't use them. Right? And then the deal was we took care of the region around. And under Barack Obama, we said to them, we don't do that anymore. The Iranians are moving into Yemen, your problem, not ours. The Iranians are building a Hezbollah in Yemen with precision weapons that can hit Riyadh, a G20 capital, which, which uh, as, uh, as, uh, as Bernard said, has some of the largest reserves in, in the world. And we, what did we do about that? Nothing. Okay, Michael, uh, um, rather Barbara, you're in. Yeah, look, uh, I don't see it in domestic political terms. Jamal Khashoggi was lured, just did. was lured into his own consulate in Istanbul and butchered. I'm sorry. You know, I think that's whatever the Chinese may do, you know, they have their own human rights abuses, but it, this was appalling. He was someone who lived in the United States, who was a peaceful advocate of change in his own society, and there has been no accountability the for that action. The Iranians and Hezbollah, the Iranians, the Iranians and Hezbollah and other Iranian proxies have uprooted 10 million people in Syria. They have killed 500,000 people in Syria. Every one of them has a name. Yeah, well, I would put that on the Oscar. I want to. I want to ask Brett McGurk a question, and then I would like Bernard to respond to the answer that Brett gives. But Brett, you had talked about unconditional love is problematic. I don't mean this to be sarcastic, but what level of love should we be showing for Saudi Arabia? To what end? Could you draw pictures? <laughs> the thing is, not only unconditional, it's also abusive, because I mentioned what President Trump has said about King Salman. I think that's uh, very important. Yeah. Look, Saudi Arabia is a critical ally of ours. We have to engage with them. I've spent a lot of time in Saudi Arabia. Um, but what happened in the first years of the Trump administration was just a total green light, and you saw all sorts of reckless 
reckless behavior, which has damaged our interests. Our allies in the region now are divided. The UAE, a critical ally of ours, is leaving Yemen. Donald Trump, you might think, wants to be more present in the Middle East to correct for some of the mistakes of the Obama administration, but he says publicly, why are our ships there? What are we doing there? There is no confidence in the region that, that Donald Trump wants to be engaged in the region. So it has to be a level of engagement with a very close partner of the United States who shares interests with ours, but also has a lot of differences with ours. But when you're not engaged, when you don't have an ambassador, when your Secretary of State is cut out of the loop, you end up seeing reckless behavior. It creates a classic moral hazard. So, 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 the, so the solution is what? The solution is to have, I mean, we finally have a strong ambassador in Saudi Arabia, you're engaged. To, 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 in order to be telling him the Saudis what to do? Yes, you have to, you have to be regularly engaged and say this, if you do this, that would be very bad. Bernard? And then I'll yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think that the relationship with the United States and Saudi Arabia, this highly personalized form of the relationship, is not helpful to either side. We have to build institutional links like we used to once have between the intelligence services and so on, but also to explain to Saudi Arabia that if you're going to be an ally, that's, that, that established certain limits. So on what are you, you on the do. other side? Are, are you now arguing the other side? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not arguing on the other side. Okay. I, think that, I think that you have to give Saudi Arabia support for all the good things that it's doing, yeah. and then you have to tell them discreetly that certain things that they're doing are wrong, and they, have to, they, they shouldn't do that. Well. I mean, the primary problem is the President Trump is continuing the policy of President Obama, and that is uh, the disengagement of the United States from the Middle East, the retreat of the United States from the Middle East. When the United States retreats from the Middle East, guess what? Other people are going to go in the vacuum, in this case, MBS, and MBS simply can't handle it. Saudi Arabia as a society can't handle it. So you want more of America, less of Saudi Arabia. We have one minute left. We have two speakers I'd like to have. Give, have a last word, Michael and Barbara. Michael, can you take it first? And really try to keep it to 30 seconds. I'll stop you at 30. We have to start from the assumption that we're not going to do more. This is the point. We're not going to do more, and we have to work with the powers that exist, the powers that are comfortable with the American, uh, with, with the American order. There is a country in the region, Iran, that is trying to overturn the American order, and it's supported by Russia. We have to look at the region very clear, in a very clear-eyed fashion and work with those people that want to keep the American order and keep stability, fight terrorism, and, uh, and, and keep the problems of the Middle East in the Middle East and Thank not you. elsewhere. Barbara Slavin. Yeah, the Iranians are an opportunistic power, and they are profiting from the numerous mistakes made by the United States and its allies in the region. Mike, you served in the Bush administration. The invasion of Iraq was the main reason why Iran has more influence in the region. Brett, and Brett and, and I, Iraq, I, not me. You know, I don't think it's fair to bring, bring Syria into this. <laughs> What's happened in Syria is terrible. But let me just say that MBS, you know, it's not just Khashoggi. 64 of the Saudis detained in the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, their whereabouts are unknown. 30 others have been forcibly disappeared. Uh, Lujain al hathloul one of the champions of women driving, has been rotting in prison, tortured. This, we have influence in Saudi Arabia. We don't have influence with Assad. We should be doing something about that. Thank you. That concludes our debate on resolution number one, Trump is right on Saudi Arabia. And a reminder of where we are, we have five panelists at this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate, debating several different resolutions on shifting power in the Middle East. Our second resolution is going to be looking at Iran and particularly the uh, aftermath of the Iran nuclear deal being first agreed to and then called off. The Iran nuclear deal, officially called the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, was meant to slow down Iran's development of nuclear weapons. It was negotiated and agreed to by the Obama administration. It was called off by the Trump administration. Now Iran is beginning to cross some of the boundaries that that deal set in place. The upshot of all of this, that's what we're gonna be going after with this next resolution. The world is safer without the JCPOA, without the Iran deal. Our first speaker on this resolution will be Raul Mark Garrett. Raul Mark Garrett on the resolution. The world is safer without the JCPOA. Are you yes or no? Can you say it out loud for the folks at yes. home? Yes, yes. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I look at this fairly straightforwardly. One, at the historian in me says, you know, it's a little too soon to tell. But what we do know, I think, is a general rule. It's not a good idea for American foreign policy to be built on self-deception. 
Uh, that's essentially what the JCPOA is. We're deceiving ourselves of its value. Uh, it should not be built on blackmail. That's essentially what the Iranians were doing. They were saying, if you do not do, if, if they don't publicly do certain things with the nuclear program clandestinely, they can do whatever they want because the system of verification that deal is so awful, uh, that we'll give you billions of dollars in return. I also think appeasement isn't a terribly good uh, start for American foreign policy, and that's essentially what we're doing. We're appeasing the Iranians. We're giving them billions and billions of dollars, and they can use it any way they wish. And the way, one of the ways they use it is by expanding their influence in the Middle East, by engaging in mass slaughter uh, in Syria. And I think we should always dwell on that, the Iranian role. Uh, that, they ha that they've had in Syria. They've essentially run much of the Syrian armed forces. They have been the masters on the ground. Uh, and yet, we're giving them billions of dollars to engage in the slaughter of hundreds of thousands of people and to move uh, millions from that country. Uh, I think it's just a very unwise policy to deceive yourselves and thinking that down the road it's going to get better. Uh, we should approach this realistically. Now, we do not know what Donald Trump is going to do. No one does, including him. <laughs> Thank you, Roel Mark Eric. The resolution, the world is safer without the JCPOA. Bernard Haeckel, how do you declare? I would say it is uh, absolutely safer. And that is because uh, Iran took advantage of this deal to build up its ballistic missile capability to uh, it used the money that was given to it by the United States to spend not on its own population, but on proxy fighters and militiamen who fought in, in Syria in the Civil War. They built better drones, better guidance systems for their missiles and their drones, which we're, we're now seeing being deployed in Yemen that are threatening the uh, Straits of Bab el Mandeb. Um, the Iranians basically uh, took advantage of this deal and uh, said, you know, well, we'll halt this nuclear stuff, which they can always restart. And in, in return, we gave them a pass on all the other stuff that they were doing, which made the region much more dangerous uh, than it ever has been. So I think that, uh, you know, it is definitely safer. And it is also, and I agree here with Ruel, which is that it is built on a deception. It's in fact built on a form of hubris and pride. The United States believed certain elites in the United States, and you'll hear this view in a minute, uh, felt, <laughs> felt that you, we could move within the Iranian, within the different circles of power in Iran, we could kind of push the moderates against the, against the more extremists and that the deal would help the moderates. This is all hogwash. Iran is a theocracy. It's run by one man, and that man is no moderate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bernard Haeckel. <laughs> Michael Duran on the resolution, the world is safer without the JCPOA. Are you yes or no? Yes, I'm, uh, I'm with my colleagues here. I agree with every word that they said. Uh, it was a massive self-deception. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we know now from the atomic archive, which the Israelis spirited out of Tehran, is that we didn't understand how far along Iran was in terms of building uh, a nuclear weapons program. It was much more advanced in, in terms of uh, uh, weaponization than, than we realized. And we also didn't realize that they, had, uh, that they were continuing a clandestine program. Uh, it's all much clearer now. What they did back in 2003 when the United States went into Iraq, they were afraid that, uh, that uh, George W. Bush might attack them. Uh, and their, uh, some of their program had been discovered and was being investigated by the International Atomic Energy Association. And so what they did is they started to emphasize the parts of the program to declare the parts of the program that could be plausibly explained as part of a, um, a civil nuclear program while putting deeper underground the hidden parts. And when I say underground, I mean actually underground, like the Fordo missile, the, the Fordo um, uh, site, which was built solely to enrich uranium to build an, uh, a, a nuclear weapon. Uh, and under the JCPOA, they have kept Fordo, and they haven't, they haven't done any of the repurposing of it that they were supposed to do according to the agreement. So what we have done is given an international cover for them to continue their covert program. Thank it's you, Michael Duran. It's a massive self-deception. Thank you. Mm -hmm. On the resolution, once again, the world is safer without the JCPOA. Barbara Slavin, do you declare yes or no? The world is definitely not 
safer without the JCPOA. You notice that these gentlemen are all referring to missiles and other issues. The deal was supposed to prevent Iran from developing a nuclear weapon for at least 15 years by preventing Iran from having sufficient material to make a nuclear weapon for 15 years. It provided for the most intrusive inspection system ever negotiated, and Iran was in full compliance with this agreement when President Trump withdrew. Since he did that, the Middle East has become a much more dangerous place than it was before. The Iranians were patient for a year. They did nothing. They took no steps. But after a year, and after the Trump administration imposed a total embargo on the sale of Iranian oil, all of a sudden there were sabotage incidents in the Persian Gulf, and the Iranians have begun to exceed some of the limits set in the JCPOA. We are profoundly not safer. In terms of their regional influence, this is something that goes back a long time, has to do with other mistakes made by the United States, and the fact that our own diplomacy is so poor should not be a reason for railing against the Iranians for having influence in the region. We were safer with the deal, we could have built on it, now we have nothing. Thank you, Barbara Slavin. Brett McGurk on the resolution, the world is safer without the JCPOA. Are you yes or no? I'm also a no. I just think, look at the facts. On June 21st, uh, just a couple months ago, uh, President Trump tweeted that he was cocked and loaded to bomb three strike strikes in Iran, but then 10 minutes before the strike, he said he stopped it because he learned at the last minute he might kill 150 Iranians. So just think about that. We are on the verge of a new military conflict, which even if you think that strike was justified, and I could actually argue that case, it would have been launched with no, no thought to it. The, consequences, no planning for the consequences. Iran would have reacted. How would we have rea reacted? And up the escalatory ladder, it would have gone. And how did we get to that point? Trump pulled out of this deal without any consideration of what would happen or what would come next. And the question for, on the resolution is not whether the JCPOA is a good or bad deal. The question is whether the world is safer. I will stipulate Iran is a terrible, terrible uh, country under the leader of uh, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei. Iran has killed colleagues of mine. Iran is an enemy of the United States of America. But is the world safer without the deal? The answer is no. Since Trump left the deal with no plan, Iranian behavior in the region has gotten worse, even according to the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. It's gotten more aggressive, targeting oil tankers in the Straits of Hormuz. It's actually increased support in many ways to its proxy militias. It has dramatically strengthened its ties with Russia and China, our two great power competitors. And if we get into an ill-conceived war with Iran, we will lose the century to China. There's a lot more to say on this topic, but given the time, the answer is no. Thank you, Brett McGurk. So on the resolution, the world is safer without the JCPOA, we have three yeses and we have two noes. Um, I want to take the point that both Barbara Slavin and uh, Brett McGurk, who are the two noes on this, to, um, to Raul Mark Garrett, who are basically saying Iran's behavior since the U.S. pulled out of the deal has gotten worse. The world is not safer. The world is less safe demonstrably at the hands of Iran's activities. Uh, I'm not sure how you can argue that. I mean, I think it's fair to say that Iran's behavior before they pulled out of the JCPO was abominable, it was atrocious, it was hideous. Uh, it was during Obama's administration that uh, the Iranians went wild uh, in Syria, and President Obama did nothing. Uh, part of the reason why he did nothing, I think, because he was gunning for this nuclear deal and he was gunning for the illusion of having some diplomatic breakthrough with the Islamic Republic. And I just have to get back to this. We don't know what the Iranians are doing clandestinely. The JCPOA is like Swiss cheese. Uh, the notion that we have an idea of what they're doing clandestinely was, I think, disproved uh, by what happened immediately after the deal was sealed, and that is we went back into Parchin and this sort of robot-controlled, Iranian-controlled inspection, and what did we find? We found two more particles of uranium. What did the IEA do? Nothing. It did nothing because no one wanted to do anything. The Israelis gave the uh, IAE information about a warehouse uh, in Tehran, which came out of the uh, documents that were seized. 
What did they find there? Uranium so, again. So what you're on the an old IAEA program. From so an your old point program. is that they were cheating on the deal. No, I, they could be cheating. We don't know. I, we didn't. I wanna, inter we didn't interview any of their scientists. We didn't get the paperwork. We didn't follow any of the standard protocols that the IAEA uses. Let me we, bring. Let me bring Barbara in. Uranium. It, Particles like that can, as we know, they have a, an enormous half-life. How do you know that this didn't let's date go, to the let's to go find out. previous work, which was stopped I, in 2003? I agree with you, Barbara. Let's go find out. Let's go back in there and inspect. Well, how are we supposed to do that if this deal is collapsing? And what are the, what's the IAEA going to do if we have no agreement? The Europeans can call for that any time they want. I'm sorry. We've undermined the deal. Michael We've Durant, undermined our ability to Michael find Durant, out what's Michael I want to point on. out that you actually argued this this uh, treaty in a previous debate with us. And I won. <laughs> <laughs> that night you won. Decisively. No. Let's yeah. not get ahead of our skis here. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. The, uh, uh, I think what, what Ruel is saying is that the IAEA is, is not going in and inspecting because the powers, the JCPOA powers, have sent a very clear message to it that they don't want them to go in and inspect sites because they know that if they go to a military site and demand inspection, as they have the right to under the JCPOA, the Iranians will say, get stuffed, and that will end the JCPOA. So there's this, there's this dance going on, this self-delusion, where the IAEA is not asking questions that it knows it's going to get a bad answer to. Brett McGurk, I mean, there's a little bit of a note here that Iran is dangerous anyway, with or without nuclear weapons, that it has, and, and this came out, it has, uh, uh, it has money, it has influence, it has bedfellows in dangerous and risky places. How does that factor come into this whole conversation about the world is safer or not without the deal? Look, they have a nuclear program. We gave them this Particles for Peace program that Eisenhower started. We actually started their nuclear program. They then made a clandestine program through AQ Khan and the Russians and the Chinese, but they have a nuclear program. This is the real world. I'm not ideological about this. I'm very practical. How do you deal with the nuclear program? There are two ways. Diplomacy through a deal is not going to be perfect. We want to buy as much time as you can, or a military strike. And all assessments of a military strike is reported in the New York Times and not disclosing anything. You're going to set the program back by one or two years, and then what? So, I mean, the, the question is, do you favor a military strike to set back the program one or two years, or do you favor very imperfect diplomacy to buy time? You hear a lot about the fact that since, since tr uh, sanctions came back on Iran, they have a lot less money. Here's the truth. They spend very little money on these proxy groups. Right. Even according to State Department figures that came out uh, last year, they spend about $2 billion a year max on their proxy groups. You are not going to sanction your way to better Iranian behavior. I agree with my colleagues to the right of this stage. I don't like the Iranians. They are an enemy of the United States of America. We have to work with our allies around the world to build alliances to make sure that we contain their behavior and push back. But we are at risk by this unilateral policy, as I mentioned, of losing the century here in the region to China and Russia. I was in Beijing not long ago. The Chinese have a very sophisticated Middle East policy. They are investing in four countries with comprehensive strategic partnerships. Iran, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and UAE. And the Saudis are embracing this posture. We are increasingly isolated by the way Trump has gotten out of this deal, and I do not believe it's working in our interest. Bernard, do you want to respond to that? Well, I, I mean, I, 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 would say, I would say that coming out of this deal has basically just lifted the veil on, uh, on this regime and on the people who have been trying to s pretend that this is a regime that can moderate, that can change, that can become different. And the, the, the way in which Iran has often been described is that there's this But do, do, you, do you think the deal was premised on that notion that Iran yes. would go premised through the absolutely. That That's not the, absolutely. The deal was premised on the notion that there were these two factions within the, within the regime and that ultimately some, some form of normalization would, would, would happen, would come out and result from this deal because people within Iran would, would say, look, you know, su such benefits have come out of this. We need to become closer t and, and, and better, have a better relationship with the West. And that's just never going to happen. This is a regime that every Friday in its principal mosque, every Friday for 40 years, has cried out death to America. Every but day. Imagine if your if opponents are arguing that at, at least 
deny that regime 15 years worth of nuclear development as opposed to responding after the fact for a two-year delay, that that 15 years is better than two years? Well, first of all, I don't think that delay actually, as my two colleagues have, have argued, was actually uh, possible. Second, it gave them a pass on all this other stuff that they were doing. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you, if you had stopped everything, the ballistic missiles, the proxy stuff, then fine. I would, I would think, I would say this is a good deal, but it's not that. All right, let me go to one of the two no's. So I would just, Barbara or Brett? Barbara can argue the intricacies of the nuclear deal. That's really not my area. I'll just say they're starting the nuclear program again. I don't think Donald Trump realizes the corner into which his national security team has put him in. The, the decision will be, do we do a military strike or not? And Trump has already shown he doesn't want to do that. So we have a maximum pressure policy without the backbone of a president that's ready to see it through. So even if I took this, and I, I agree with a lot of what my colleagues to the right of the stage say, uh, this, this strategy just uh, really makes, makes no sense. But the question really is they have a nuclear program. This is reality, folks. And in terms of the entire internet, the intelligence community, all the agencies of the intelligence community, in their report, they say, and they've said it consistently now, and the State Department just confirmed it a few months ago, Iran is not now going through the mechanisms through which to produce a nuclear weapon. They have not done that but since Brett, 2003. But, Brett, your opponent's argument has been that the, that the Americans and, and perhaps also the inspectors are guilty of, or have committed self-deception. They're kidding themselves. Yeah. And that was two of the argument, two of your opponents made that. So I just got to say, so look, take that on. Look, it's a, it's a dangerous world out there, as President Trump has said, um, but sometimes you have to trust the unanim unanimous judgment of the intelligence community, and I recognize the intelligence You're community kidding. can be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> they can be wrong. Absolutely kidding. The agency but we now has have an incredible track record on nuclear issues, let alone so many other issues, of getting things wrong. Yeah. So, I mean, the 2007 NIE said clearly they had stopped developing their nuclear weapons program. The Israeli archives that were snitched out of Tehran clearly show that's false. It is an untenable position now. Barbara. Barbara Slavin. Bibi Netanyahu is running for re-election. If there were a real facility in Iran working, on, working covertly on nuclear weapons, he would have disclosed it to the world. Instead, he had some pathetic announcement the other week about some facility, it wasn't even clear if it was nuclear or a missile that the Iranians had destroyed. There is not, at present, a, uh, a program, a dedicated program to make nuclear weapons. But there will be. There is. There will be if the United States stays out of the JCPOA, if the sanctions remain, and this agreement falls apart. That's, I, I, there I is. think a logical mind has to look at the Persian material, and I don't think you've looked at it, Barbara, since you don't know Persian, that if you look at the material, it is clear there is a program. That program continued after 2003. Now, why would the Iranians have stopped a program that they had invested to a uh, clandestine program which they knew the Americans and others were going to come after? Why would they stop it? Michael well, Duran, uh, Michael Duran, I want to take on the part of uh, the part of this deal that uh, Iranian assets, assets were frozen and sanctions were lifted. There was a financial payoff for the Iranians as a result of this deal, which they now lose. But what, is, what are the implications of that payoff having been in place? And Brett McGirt and, and Barbara agree. It was their own that, money, that they're, you they're know. It was their own oil money. We didn't give them anything. But, well, but, they, but they, they can now have more money to do bad stuff if that's what they want to do. But you two have argued that they're not actually spending that much money on bad stuff. But I want you to take that point on, uh, Michael. Well, uh, look, I, I mean, uh, Brett, um, I say this with re respect and love. Um, uh, uh-oh, uh, uh -oh. <laughs> uh, You're talking out of both sides of your mouth, right? Uh, on, on, on the one hand, you're saying we, we need to contain Iran, but on the other hand, you're saying, well, they have a nuclear program and there's nothing we can do about it. And oh, by the way, the main, the main actor in the Middle East who's going to help us contain Iran in the Arab world, Saudi Arabia, we have a problem with, it, with them as well. So when you start adding up all of the different positions you're taking, you're really saying we have to give Iran a pass. And there's, there is not a, the choice is not between war and, uh, uh, war and, um, and, giving them a, uh, and giving them a pass. The choice is containment, uh, just like we did with the Soviet Union throughout, throughout its entire history. One of the problems with the deal is, uh, there are two major problems with the deal. One, it did not stop their program in any way. It just allowed them to reconfigure it and gave an international legitimacy for, for a program that continued and it handed them enormous resources 
to pursue their aggressive policies across the region. And that's why they're now in Yemen, which they weren't before until the, until the, J, until the, uh, the JCPOA. It's why they are, now, uh, they are now running the show. They're more influential in Iraq than we are. And they are, uh, and they are uh, running the government, basically, certainly the military forces of, uh, uh, of Syria. Let all of that happened, Brett, all of that, all of that happened within the context of the JCPOA. It's not simply a nuclear deal. It was a, it was a, it was a pass to Iran writ large. So Brett, I just, Brett, I have Brett. to say, look, let's bring this conversation into the situation room. And I just, the facts are Iran has a nuclear program. They definitely have a civilian nuclear program. No question they had a weapons program. I don't always trust the intelligence I get, but it is a unanimous judgment that they are not now pursuing a nuclear weapon. Before the deal, they are one to two months away from being able to develop a bomb. The question here, the big question is, this is a question the president will face, any future president. How many months are they away now? How many months are they away now? According to the intelligence, look, according to the intelligence community, and you can, is a year. It, the point, but Mike, the point is, okay, they have this program, it's a fact. Do we, we bought, bomb it? We bought 10 months. Do we bomb we it? We bought 10 months. That's a lot of time. And gave them all, gave them, gave them, opened all the doors of the region okay. to them and gave, and bought 10 months. When I your stupid Bush administration invaded Iraq, we opened the region to them. I mean, you have to look at all the factors. This is, this is not the fault of the JCPOA. This is the fault of foolish and stupid U.S. intervention in the region. Support for autocratic regimes like Saudi Arabia. I mean, Iran has an affinity with these groups. Why? Because many of them are oppressed Shia minorities. If Saudi Arabia treated its own Shia better, there would be no room for Iran to play. If Saddam Hussein had not oppressed the Shia majority of his country, we would not see what we have now. Yeah, Barbara, I mean, you can't I, put it all on I, the JC. By the way, it's ridiculous. I remind you. I'm just I, I, curious. Could you use that can argument, I, can, Syria? Can I just, yeah, I was just going to say. I was just going to remind in you. Syria. I was just going to remind you of the 500,000 people who have been yeah, killed well, there was at the hands of the Iranians. There was proxies. something called the Arab Spring, which had nothing to do with the JCPOA. And, and Assad is a brutal bastard, and there is no doubt that he has had support from Iran, and there is no doubt support. that he's Iran had support runs from the, Russia. Iran runs the military forces on the ground in Syria. There's no Syrian army. Tell it's me Iran, how and Iran and with a nuclear weapon is going to make And that, that concludes situation. our debate on this second resolution. <laughs> the world is safer without the JCPOA. <laughs> We were going a little Pardon cable me. news there. Um, <laughs> right. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, our third topic zooms in on a nation that is locked into the middle of everything, and that is Turkey. Turkey, which sits between Asia and Europe. Turkey, which sits between Russia and the Arab world. But more recently, a Turkey which is actually shifting somewhat between democracy and autocracy. Turkey has been a member of the NATO alliance for most of the time most of us have been alive. Given recent trends, however, there are questions being raised about that last fact, which we are framing as a resolution this way. Turkey is an asset to NATO. On that resolution, our first speaker will be Bernard Haeckel. Bernard Haeckel, on that resolution, Turkey is an asset to NATO. Are you yes or no? I'm a yes, absolutely. I mean, Turkey is a hugely important country. It's one of the most important countries in, in the Middle East, as was mentioned earlier, the others being Israel and Saudi Arabia. Turkey has an absolutely massive population, a very strong military, has been a stalwart ally of the West for many, many decades, and it is tragic to see it move away, uh, as it has done, uh, from the Western alliance. And, uh, and, and you have to keep in mind that this is also a period when the Russians are coming into, back into the Middle East, and there are uh, relations between the Turks and the Russians, which are detrimental to Western interests, uh, purchasing of the S-400 uh, missiles, uh, and all kinds of other uh, all kinds of other deals. Could you take a minute, 20 seconds? I'll give you the added 20 seconds just to explain what that missile purchase is. So that, that's a that's a very high end uh, Russian. Uh, a missile system that's uh, ground to air. It can shoot down virtually any plane that flies uh, in the air. And, and the significance and, is that it's and, Russian. And it's Russian, and it's also not interoperable with the equipment that already exists in Turkey, which is all Western. And so this is a very bad uh, development. I think that Turkey, one of the reasons that Turkey has moved in the direction that it has away from the, the West has to do with the politics of the Middle East, in particular the question of the Kurds and the cozying up uh, between the Americans and the Kurds, 
uh, in the war against ISIS, and Brett here would know all about that. Um, and I think it's, it's crucial to, to, to look to Turkey and to tell them that, you know, this, que this question of the Kurds does not mean in any way a, d a diminution in the alliance or the support that the West and specifically the United States has to give to Turkey. So Turkey is fundamental. It has to remain in NATO. And I hope we, to God, that we, we, we keep it there. Thank you, Bernard Haeckel. Michael Duran, the resolution goes to you. Turkey is an asset to NATO, yes or no? Yes, uh, emphatically yes. Um, uh, I agree with everything that, uh, that my colleague uh, uh, Bernard said. Um, and I want to tell you that there's a story that hasn't been told in the United States, which is about the way that we abandoned our ally, Turkey. I mean, I think people are very familiar with, this, with all of the story about how um, uh, Erdogan has turned away from the West. But um, uh, one of the problems with Erdogan is, uh, and, and I would say actually Turkey in general, this is a nation that does not have a public relations gene. Uh, because they have a very good story to tell in the United States, and they haven't told it. Um, we, went into, um, uh, we went into Syria through the YPG, which is the Syrian arm of the PKK. Those are the separatist uh, Kurds in Turkey who want to carve out a Kurdistan from Turkey. They're an extremist terrorist organization recognized by the United States as a, uh, as a terrorist organization. This is the equivalent of the United States going into, say, Jordan and building up Hamas, and when the Israelis say, you know, what you're doing there next, right next to, to our country, building up this organization that wants to tear my country apart is not good for us, we said, sit down and shut up. Uh, we told them, sit down and shut up. And w when there was a coup attempt against Erdogan, orchestrated by Gulen, who sits in Pennsylvania, and Erdogan said, hey, can you uh, extradite that guy? We said, sit down and shut up. So uh, at a certain point, he said, you know what? They're actually anti-Turkey. Today, forget about Erdogan, 80% of Turks, according to opinion polls, regard the United States as a hostile power. Thank you, There's Michael There's a reason Durant. for that. Thank you. <laughs> the floor moves to Barbara Slavin. On the resolution, Turkey is an asset to NATO, are you yes or no? Unbelievably, I agree <laughs> with my colleagues here on this one. I'm changing um, my vote. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe for slightly uh, different reasons. I'll let Brett speak to the, the YPG and the Kurds and all of that. Um, I, just, I just think it's important to keep Turkey tethered to the West. Uh, it's, it's a very important, it's a very large country. Um, and yes, Erdogan has taken it in very uh, undemocratic directions, but we've seen a resurgence of Turkish democracy recently. There were municipal elections and all the major municipalities, including Istanbul, voted against the, uh, the government-supported candidates. So uh, there, are d there are now defections from the ruling AK party. Some of their most talented uh, uh, officials, former officials, are now going to start a new party. So I think the last thing we want to do is to move away from Turkey now when Erdogan finally is beginning to look uh, a little bit weaker. The other thing is the neighborhood Turkey is in. I mean, if we, if we push them out of NATO, that just pushes them even more into the laps of the Russians uh, and, and the Iranians, which is certainly not in, in our interest. Um, you know, NATO is not the EU. There have been countries with rather authoritarian regimes in NATO. Uh, Spain and Portugal, famously, at the beginning. So we should keep Turkey in, not out, and uh, let's be patient. Let's, let's have some faith in the Turkish people. Thank you, Barbara Slavin. <laughs> Brett McGurk, Turkey is an asset to NATO, yes or no? I'm going to say no. Thank not, you. I, Interesting. I am not saying we should kick Turkey out of NATO, but the question of the present tense, are they an asset to NATO? And what is NATO? It's a vital transatlantic alliance aim to protect the security and prosperity of its members. And on that standard, Turkey right now is not an asset to NATO. I'm going to look at the Trump administration's national security strategy. What do we care about? Great power competition, China and Russia, international terrorism, and Iran. On all three measures right now, Turkey is not an asset. On international terrorism, I have to look. I ran the ISIS campaign. 40,000 foreign fighters, jihadis from 110 countries around the world, all came into Syria to fight in that war, and they all came through Turkey. Yeah. The caliphate was on the border of Turkey. We worked with Turkey. I was in Turkey more than any other country to have them seal their border, and they would not do it. They said they couldn't do it. 
But the minute the Kurds took parts of the border, it's totally sealed with a wall. So let's just be honest about the record. It is not the fact that we went with the YPG and told, told Turkey to sit in a corner. That's just not factual. On Iran, Turkey was the biggest sanctions buster backdoor of any country around the world to Iran. Almost $100 billion in a sanctions busting scheme went through Turkey by their own state-owned bank, the general manager of whom was prosecuted here in the Southern District of New York. And Erdogan accused that judge and the entire our judicial system of being run by the cleric in Gulan in Pennsylvania, which is ridiculous. On Russia, Turkey is buying, the only NATO member buying sophisticated military hardware from Russia. That is a serious problem. NATO is an alliance right, formed Gerken, against sorry, Russia. Time is up, so the answer I think you're going to have no. a lot of chance to talk in the next section. <laughs> Turkey is an asset to NATO. Rule Mark Eric, are you yes or no? I think I detected a few Greeks in the audience. <laughs> but uh, we need your uh, participation. Uh, is there any possibility I can do uh, you yes no. or no? Just do waffle. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh. Uh, I mean, it's, I have. Uh, uh, can you tell the listening audience what your choice? I, I, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm very, to I'm very torn here. Uh, <laughs> One person. Well, let me, for the record, say that you have put up the flag. No. No, but I, I wrote waffle. Waffle. So, uh, which is what I want to do. Um, I mean, I, 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 when I lived in Turkey for a number of years, I'm very fond of the Turks, and Istanbul is the greatest city on earth. Um, you know, I, I, I think that Turkey, in and of itself, remains a potential asset uh, to NATO. It, uh, and I agree uh, uh, with Barbara. I think it should remain, to the extent that we can, tethered. Uh, to the United States and to the West. I think it's an investment that is well worth our while, and the great experiment of Turkey is by far, it's not over yet. With that said, I, I don't have any doubts that Erdogan uh, is a fairly determined Islamist. I am surprised that Michael actually didn't bring up this issue. I think he has a, he has a desire and a dream to take Turkey in a different direction. Uh, certainly not in an Ataturkist direction, a Kamalist direction. Uh, that cannot be possibly be good for the United States. Militarily, obviously, Turkey can no longer be brought in with the secrets of NATO. Uh, now, NATO is a very structured organization. Some people in NATO get to see more than others. Uh, Turkey is going to be at the very bottom of that list now. Uh, it has deeply compromised the F-35 program, the new uh, self a fighter program, bomber program, it's an all-purpose aircraft. Uh, you cannot possibly allow that thing to be de deployed in Turkey now. I don't know what they've done with okay. some of the intelligence agreements that we have with Turkey. Yeah. That I, I have to stop you because uh, your time is up. I'm stopped now. <laughs> okay. Thank I you waffled. very much. Thank you. That concludes the opening round of our third resolution. And um, on the resolution, Turkey is an asset to NATO, we have three yeses. We have a very, very firm no. And we have a waffle, uh, <laughs> or, uh, disguised as a no. Um, so so uh, I think, give, being the firm no, Brett, you're going to have a lot of time talking back to, uh, to your opponents. But right. uh, what, I, what I think I heard was a sort of constant theme, which uh, unites you all, actually, is that Turkey has the potential to be a fantastic uh, NATO partner. And sometimes it is. And, Sometimes it's not, and it would be better if it were, uh, depending on conditions. What I also heard was a little bit of whose fault is it that this thing is up in the air right now? And uh, Mike Duran, I think uh, you were saying that Turkey's been treated badly, and that um, the, the notion being that could be corrected, therefore. So, Brett, could you take that thought on, that uh, I think Michael's argument that uh, the reason Turkey, in your view, is not uh, an asset right now has a lot to do with our treatment of Turkey, and that that could be corrected? So first, I'm fairly confident if you look at any public opinion poll in Turkey almost any year, uh, Americans are very unpopular. Um, before we ever heard of this group, the YPG in Northeast Syria, which I can talk to, but I don't want that to dominate the whole debate, but before we ever heard of the YPG, and we decided to go to war against ISIS because ISIS was committing genocide and it was controlling 11, 8 million people across Iraq and Syria, you all know about ISIS. We went to Turkey and said, hey, let's fight this together. We want to fly to Vinterlik Air Base to target uh, ISIS. We need you to do some things on the border, et cetera, et cetera. And frankly, I have to be honest, they did nothing. They would not let us fly out of Vinterlik Air Base. They would not let us do anything. It was incredibly frustrating. We tried to do everything we possibly could with the Syrian opposition working out of Turkey. And too many times, they were completely interwoven with extremist groups tied to Al-Qaeda that we could not work with. And Turkey, frankly, did not do much to help at all. Mm. The YPG was a group 
that was surrounded by ISIS. It, for, for those who don't know the terminology. The YPG what? is a, a Syrian Kurdish group in northeast Syria. They were about to be slaughtered with a m bunch of Kurdish civilians at a little it, town on the border the of Turkey. Uh, they're affiliated with- Is it the PKK? We'll come back, we'll come back to that, Michael. Have, has there, here's a key question. Has there ever been an attack from Syria into Turkey from this group? The answer is no. The answer is no. And Frank, and who made the decision, who made the decision to arm the YPG? It was actually President Trump, not President Obama. So there's a lot of history here that I want to make sure that we get absolutely right. But when ISIS was about to take this Kurdish town on the border uh, with Turkey, we made the decision to do what we could to help save this town. Kobani. And frankly, at the time, Turkey was working with the YPG. They did an operation into, into Turkey, working co in cooperative with the, with the YPG. I was in Accra to manage that operation, and it was a big success. And as, as soon as the Kurds started taking these towns away from ISIS on the border, Turkey totally sealed their border. We said, why didn't you seal the border when ISIS was there? And flatbed trucks were coming across the border with ammonium nitrate and weapons and all sorts of things. So there's a lot of history here, but the argument that Turkey suddenly turned a switch because we worked with the YPG uh, is just simply not true. Barbara, could you, do, could you do us the favor of just a little education and, and take four sentences to explain to people who may not be completely familiar with the Turkish-Kurdish relationship, what that's about? Because that's, <laughs> that's critical in the, the conversation. Yeah, it, it is, and, and you know, and, and Brett may know this better, but there was actually a, a peace process. There are many, many Kurds in Turkey. Ethnic Kurds make up, what, 30% of the population, probably. Okay, so just um, very basically, the Kurds are an ethnic the, the group? Cur the Kurds are the world's largest ethnic group without their own country. There are Kurds in Iran, there are Kurds in Iraq, there are Kurds in Syria, there are Kurds in Turkey. They are the largest ethnic minority in Turkey. And there have been uh, clashes, there have been guerrilla groups, there have been, there's been terrorism. There was a peace process, though. One of the reasons Erdogan was initially so popular uh, was because he actually agreed to, to peace with the Kurds, and, uh, and then this peace agreement fell apart, and I'm still not really clear on whose fault that is. I think. I think that Erdogan got paranoid. He saw that Kurds were becoming more prominent uh, in Syria. He got worried, and, and there were incidents. Who started it, Brett? Who, who, who attacked whom first? But there were, there were incidents that the ceasefire broke, and then, uh, and then Erdogan got very, very okay. upset right. about U.S. working I, I, with I the Kurdish groups against in, ISIS. I don't want to go too deeply into the background, but I also want to add the fact, and Brett has alluded to it, that the Kurds have been our allies in, against ISIS. They've been very Some effective. of them have, and it's been very critical. But Bernadette Haeckel, I want to take to you um, Brett's point that at critical moments, the Turks have not acted like allies. They haven't done the things allies do at, as requested, and that's a pretty serious charge and a pretty good definition of a bad ally, so can you take that response on? Well, look, I mean, uh, Turkey is an independent country, and for instance, the first instance where they didn't do what the United States wanted them to do was to join in uh, in 2003 in the, in, the, in the war against Iraq. They, for, they, they forbade the United States from using Turkey as a launching uh, a pad uh, for the Iraqi invasion. And that proved very costly for the United States because we had to f f go get around Turkey. So, you know, the Turks have their own kind of independent and autonomous policy, and they don't always see eye to eye with us. Uh, on, on ISIS, they probably thought that the Kurds were more dangerous than, than, uh, than the Islamic State. That comes as a real shock to us as Americans. Right. But you know they have but 20 the, but the fact the that they're dancing with Russia and they're dancing with China right now, who are our most existentially concerning uh, rivals out there, does that not seem non-alliance-like? Yes, but I think one of the reasons they're doing that is because they don't feel that we have their back. Michael Duran. Uh, back in 2015, the uh, the Turks shot down a, a Russian airplane. And we uh, and they looked to NATO to support them against the uh, against the Russians, and we treated it like a bilateral problem. We said we hope that you Turks and you Russians sort out this problem. We didn't treat it. Russia was probing all along the NATO air airspace from the from the uh, from the Baltics all the way down to the Balkans, even into even into British airspace. The Russians were probing. We could have used this as an example to say that this is un that this is unacceptable. The Turks shot down a Russian over Turkish airspace at the time, so um, we that sent a very clear signal. It was I'm, I'm not just talking about the one incident. I'm talking about the entire Syria conflict. Mm -hmm. We are the only country in the world that went in and said 
we, the, the overwhelming priority, the, the, the number one priority of the United States is to destroy ISIS. Everyone else in the region had a very simple and logical and important question, and that is, what order is going to replace the order that is in, that is in Syria Let now? Let me bring in Brad. Who's going to fill this vacuum? Can I, just one more sentence? One sentence. We never went to the Turks and said, let's work together to build an order, because we didn't like their answer. Hmm. Brett? I just, Mike and I say this with all due respect, but... Um, Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Love and affection. But the problem with Michael's, I'm just going to back the lens up. This is a, a debate about the Middle East. The problem with his formula for the Middle East is he mentions Israel, Turkey, Saudi Arabia. Israel and Saudi Arabia, if they have really won, I mean, Iran is obviously enemy number one, enemy number one and a half is Erdogan. Saudi Arabia and Turkey are fighting proxy wars and supporting different groups all throughout the region. Yeah. This is a serious, uh, serious uh, problem. But the truth is that when it came to ISIS, we had to fight ISIS. I mean, I, what, what is the formula here? There was no Syrian opposition group that we could work with uh, that could be effective. We invested hundreds of millions of dollars through the Department of Defense in certain groups, and we, when we inserted them into Syria, they gave half their equipment to Al Qaeda, and they ended up going backwards when they started military operations. This is a very desperate situation. Uh, but we did all we possibly could with Turkey. I was in Turkey, again, more than any other country in the entire coalition that we built. Um, but it's not just Northeast Syria. Turkey's threatening to come in Northeast Syria to attack the Kurds, which will put American lives at risk. That's a serious problem. Erdogan is also saying, at the same time, he wants to push the Greeks into the sea because he has claims uh, in, the, in the Eastern Mediterranean. This is, this is a problem throughout the region right now. Erdogan is a serious destabilizing actor. Let me bring in Ruel Mark Eric. Have you de-waffled on this? Or? I'm still <laughs> sort of waffling. Uh, I mean, I would say that, I mean, it's a byproduct once again of the American retreat from the region. If uh, President Obama or President Trump had been willing to insert, say, three, 4,000 troops into Syria, I think the situation could have been different. We were not, so we played on a fault line in the Turkish uh, psychology. That's inevitable. I mean. Turkey actually does view itself as a much more fragile state than I think people in the West realize. And the primary fault line is a Kurdish one. Now, I might dissent a little bit on the way uh, Michael has described the YPG uh, in, in Syria, but I, I think you have to accept the way the, the Turks look at it, and you can understand why they got deeply nervous. And I, I don't think, and also when the Turks look at the United States, as does everyone in the region now, they're saying, is the United States really going to be there? I mean, NATO becomes a, a, a secondary issue for Turkey. Uh, if the United States is going to actually retreat from the Middle East, uh, retreating from the Middle East, I think they read that also as retreating from NATO. Look, or, look, we, NATO, what is NATO for? NATO is to counter Russia. The Iranians and the Russians moved into Iran and moved into Syria. The, the Iranians provided the ground troops, the Russians provided the air cover, and the Turks said, we don't like that. And the Obama administration said, sit down and shut up. One of the reasons we, one of the reasons we picked the YPG to fight ISIS is because the YPG has a history of good relations with Russia and Iran. It was, we knew that the, it's not that, it's not that they, were gonna, they weren't gonna go deliver their weapons to Al Qaeda and to, uh, and to other jihadi groups. It was because they, would not, they promised us they wouldn't fight the Iranians and Assad. Because not fighting was Iranians really and Assad decision. was part of the, was part, not fighting them was part of the JCPOA may just, conception. May I That's just say this is all, <laughs> this all sounds very complicated. Yes. It's very, no, it's very <laughs> I mean, simple. I mean, it's really very simple. Have overthrown it's very simple. Obama wanted to cut a deal with Iran. I want to say that. Yeah, was yeah, the, yeah, that yeah, was yeah, 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 yeah. Bernard hasn't had a, a moment. I just moment. also, I mean, just to back up. I'll come back to you, Brett. I think to back up a little bit, too. In addition to Turkey being a fragile state with 20% of its population being Kurdish, so there's always a fear of secession. The other thing about the Turks is that they were always treated very badly by the Europeans. They wanted into the European Union. They were always treated like these dirty Muslims who didn't fit in and weren't really European. And then the Americans come and often treated them also as a kind of spare tire that can only be brought out and used whenever necessary. And I think that that you know, hurt their hurt their ego and hurt their sense of pride and honor. And we're seeing the consequences of this in the behavior of Erdogan. Brett, do you want so to say I agree, I agree with something Michael said earlier very much. Our foreign policy is becoming too partisan. 
Trump this, Obama that. I totally agree with you. And yet when I hear you speak, it's all about the Obama administration. <laughs> this goes back a long time. Trump has been in office now almost three years. The S-400s were purchased on Trump's watch. It is Trump that said, we're getting out of Syria. You're all on your own, which totally spooked the Turks. So it's not all about Obama. It's not all about Trump either. It's about some pretty serious dynamics that are going on right now in Turkey under the leadership of President Erdogan that are leading that country in a bad direction. There's a romanticism about Turkey and Washington because the Turkey of how it used to be. That Turkey's not there right now. I think we want to try to get it back. That requires some serious engagement, but also requires telling the truth when they're doing things that are totally against the interests of the United States and NATO. Mm -hmm. Barbara Slavin. Yeah, it's just, you know, Michael, with all due respect, you have this fantasy and that... Love. <laughs> With, Wait, hold on. With, with, We're on the same side. We are on the same side, <laughs> but, but, but you have this fantasy that somehow more robust American intervention would have gotten rid of Assad. I mean, look at, you know. Look I don't at, know. The Russians thought the other way around. It seems to have worked. Look what happened in look what happened in Iraq. Look what happened to us in Iraq. Look what happened in Libya. You know, then comes Syria. I, I think that it's a fantasy that. Uh, that we could have overthrown Assad. And even if we had, the likely result would have been an ISIS-led state, or certainly a, a, a Sunni fundamentalist-led state. So Assad is a son of a bitch. He's horrible. But that doesn't mean that we could have somehow gone in there and changed the trajectory. And that so concludes sorry. debate on our third resolution. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. You got the last word. Yeah. Um, and I also want to say this about what we all just saw. As I said at the beginning, our goal is to, uh, it's, it sounds uh, a little too precious, but to raise a level of public discourse, the thing is we mean it. <laughs> we, sure. we do mean it. Um, and we, we work at it, we aim at it. Our team uh, is very, very careful and choosy and picky about the people we put on our stages and the issues that we debate. Uh, and the thing we always count on at the end is that the debaters will come up and really bring fact and argument and passion um, honesty uh, and respect for one another. And I just want to say that the, what the five of you did tonight absolutely lived up to it for us. So I want to thank you very much. Um, and, and in that spirit, in that spirit, I don't want to take too much time doing this, but I'm quite curious that sometimes we ask in the unresolved format. Um, was there anything that you heard from somebody on a position that opposed yours that you actually thought, ah, I gotta think about that again? Something that you found persuasive from the other side. Barbara, you're nodding yes already? Yeah, uh, on, on, on the YPG and so on, and, and Michael's description of how, how Turkey regarded what the US had done. There were, there were a couple points there that I hadn't, hadn't, really, uh, hadn't really considered that was useful for me. On and the other hand, on Iran, he's completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> how about you, Michael? Uh, there, was a, there was a point um, when uh, Brett was talking, I think his words were, um, I really agree with Michael. And <laughs> I thought that was... You liked that. I did. I, that was very persuasive. <laughs> yeah. Bernard. Bernard. Um, I have to say I'm, I'm sticking to my guns, okay, I think. Okay, fair uh, enough. You know, that's often been an answer to the question is, no, I didn't really hear anything from the other yeah. side. How about you, Brett? Well, like on Saudi Arabia, I agree with Barnard. We need Saudi Arabia to, to succeed. And I think that's why we need a, a, a dynamic policy. I just, I, I don't think Trump is approaching it the right way. Yeah, and yeah, well, actually, sorry, if we, go if we ahead. had had the opportunity to talk it out, mm -hmm. I think that uh, on the Saudi question, uh, Brett and, and, uh, and, 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 and Bernard and I were actually in the same place. But yeah. Brett interpreted the question differently. Mm -hmm. You know, it, that Trump is right on Saudi Arabia. He didn't like the way Trump was handling Saudi Arabia, but he didn't disagree that Saudi Arabia was an ally. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, yeah, I don't know if I'm putting words in your mouth. But yeah. yeah, that's right. And well, we know you have an open mind. Um, so, uh, uh, I mean, since I was schizophrenic on two of the three issues, I found myself in agreement often with others. Yeah. yeah. Oh, interesting. OK. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad for the sake of the debate that you pretended otherwise, so thank you. Um, on the first resolution, Trump is right on Saudi Arabia. Before the resolution, the vote was 15% said yes, and 85% said no. Afterwards, the vote was 16% said yes, <laughs> and 84% said no. So what I want to ask is, those, those of you who voted yes, could you just stand up for a moment so we can see you all? <laughs> 
Okay. <laughs> we, won. we won. All right. <laughs> On the second resolution, um, the world is safer without the JCPOA. Before, the vote was 17%. Yes. 83% no. After the vote was 22% yes. 78% no. The swing went towards yes. Could just the yeses stand up? On that one? <laughs> okay, on the third resolution, um, uh, Turkey is an asset to NATO. Before the vote was 71% yes, 29% no. The vote after, 60% yes, 40% no. The no's won on that one. Could the no's please stand up? Hey, you're a waffle. I'm a waffle. <laughs> he doesn't. All right. Don't. The waffler doesn't get to take credit. <laughs> so um, I just want to say it's been a pleasure to launch our season with all of you here today and with our five debaters. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. I'm John Donvan. <laughs>